The CEO of NVIDIA kind of said what experts have been saying for a while now, which is that we're still like a couple decades out from these being very commercially viable. But when NVIDIA man says it, then the market actually listens because some of these quantum stocks have been just like absolutely popping off until that happened. And then uh, some of those like sold off actually pretty significantly. Quantum computers have the potential, and I have to emphasize potential, to shake up a lot of major industries actually. Um, this is kind of the sister fields to what I got my master's in. So I thought it'd be cool to kind of talk about the history, potential market impact. And then next week, I wanted to focus on how it could impact the crypto sector, because I know that conversation has been ongoing. And it's actually a really interesting, it's really interesting um, potential dilemma. OK, so there's been a massive investment in quantum computing, according to Forbes, about 55 billion from global powers uh, into quantum computing. Uh, and this conversation got really ignited um, when Google announced Willow. It's this 105 qubit quantum chip that had an astronomical speed up for a benchmark calculation. We'll get a little bit more into that. Um, but since then, um, it's been a pretty important conversation topic. The CEO of NVIDIA kind of said what experts have been saying for a while now, which is that we're still like a couple decades out from these being very commercially viable. But when NVIDIA man says it, then the market actually listens because some of these quantum stocks have been just like absolutely popping off until that happened. And then uh, some of those like sold off actually pretty significantly. Um, but either way, it's been a really important uh, or it's been a very prominent uh, topic in the financial space. And so I wanted to talk about why there's so much hype around this technology and what sectors might be most affected um, by their emergence. Make sense? Sure. So the concept of quantum computing was kind of popularized around the 1980s by Richard Feynman, as well as some other physicists. And basically what they kind of figured out is that when you try to simulate quantum mechanics on classical machines and classical in this context just means not quantum so on regular computers, uh, you run into really significant performance issues, um, and they are very resource intensive to do on classical machines. Um, so they just kind of thought, well, hey, so why don't we use quantum mechanical particles, like, you know, quantum particles to actually simulate quantum mechanics? Maybe that will be a bit easier. Um, what is a quantum particle? Um, it's basically just a single particle. Oh, okay. So, yeah, I think of like an you know, electron, for example, like just one of them, though. Um, that's That's a whole thing. Um, we'll get into that if I can, if there's time, uh, a little bit in a little bit. But basically, um, we're going to be using quantum states, basically, to represent information uh, and do certain calculations that leverage the properties of quantum mechanics um, in a way that classical computers can't do. And again, if there's time, I'll kind of like talk about a little more of what that means, but it is actually pretty complex. And people use a lot of analogies because quantum mechanics is fundamentally weird. Um, and very different from like the, our classical world that we live in. That's what gained a lot of popularity um, among physicists, right? As this, uh, this type of technology that might be able to simulate quantum systems in a more efficient way um, or in a more possible way compared to classical um, computers. But they got a lot more attention after Shor's algorithm was published in 1994. And basically this is an algorithm that would be used on a quantum machine that solves prime factorization. And so prime factorization, like, so here's an example with 24, right? We basically just got to figure out what are the primes in 24. So 24 is 4 times 6, 4 is 2 times 2, 6 is 2 times 3. So the primes in 24 are 2 and 3, okay? Okay. It's easy with 24, but if I give you a number that's like 100 digits long, and I ask you what are the primes in this number, it's actually an extremely computationally intensive task to be able to figure that out, which is why... Prime factorization is used as the basis for a lot of cryptography. Um, so a lot of public key encryption kind of uses this method. RSA is like the protocol that's probably the most commonly used. But basically, a lot of encryption is kind of based on the fact that solving this problem would take a really, 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 really long time for a classical computer to like, I mean, like hundreds of thousands of years, potentially for a classical supercomputer to be able to solve. But with Shor's algorithm, it got quantum computers much more attention because it demonstrated that quantum computers might be able to solve this type of encryption or break this type of encryption um, in a really short period of time, actually. And that kind of brought quantum computers into more industries, into more fields, a little bit more broad applicability. And then if we go to the next slide, Grober's algorithm was published um, pretty shortly after that, um, which solves unstructured search very efficiently. So now there's implications for cryptography, but with unstructured search, like that impacts like databases quite a bit. So anything that works with large data, large amounts of data, large amounts of databases, um, even more applicability for these machines. So that demonstrated that this, you know, there might be certain types of problems that quantum computers can execute in really like very short periods of time in uh, ways that might be infeasible for classical computers. Um, 
as like kind of the history of where these things came from and where this initial hype sort of came from, at least in the more academic sphere. Make sense? Sure. So there was additional, uh, there's some additional motivations for investing this, especially from tech companies, um, because uh, there are actually physical limits on how small transistors can get. Go to the next slide. So modern computers and modern computer chips rely on uh, these little things called uh, transistors, right? Um, and obviously there's concerns about energy requirements as you get more and more transistors to do like more and more complex calculations. You obviously have to, can, you know, be worried about energy, but there's also a physical limit on how small these things can get. Um, right. So transistors are basically like the, the foundational piece of technology for modern computer chips. And the smallest one that we currently have that I found is one nanometer, one nanometer big, right? Very, very, very teeny. It's one one hundredth the width of a uh, human hair and about half the size of a human DNA strand. It's the smallest transistor that I was able to find. It's still in the exploratory research phase. It's really small. And this is from Berkeley, I believe. So, right, as you get smaller and smaller and smaller to be able to do more and more complex calculation and pack more of these things onto chips, right, you have to start worrying about quantum effects, like electron tunneling, basically, an electron being able to tunnel through a very small, very thin wall. Um, you got to worry about quantum effects as transistors get more and more small. So there's like, we believe a, a physical limit, right, on how I guess efficient classical computing can get because of some of these because of some of these uh, limiting factors. Make sense? Maybe. Sure. So a whole lot of motivations. Let's get to the maybe maybe the part that's a little bit more relevant to traders. If we go to the next slide, so. Quantum computers, it's pretty ubiquitously believed that they're not going to replace classical machines because they don't, you know, achieve astronomical speed ups for every type of problem. But there are certain types of problems where they have the potential to achieve those speed ups. So um, when I think about like which industries might be the most impacted by the emergence of quantum computers, at least what we believe now, obviously encryption, right? Cybersecurity, huge, huge potential implications there. Huge. Huge implications there. Um, but also what they were kind of like originally intended for, which were quantum uh, chemical molecular simulations that has a ton of impl implications for like drug development, medical research, material science, nanotechnology. So like companies maybe in those areas might be affected. Optimization problems. So like risk management in finance, logistics, actuarial science, energy, certain machine learning problems. If AI wasn't you know speeding up quickly enough, um, we could even have more speed up uh, for certain machine learning problems. And then search problems. High frequency trading. High frequency trading. Oh, man, if you think markets are crazy now. Um, but then also search problems. So that affects pretty much any industry that relies on very large databases. So healthcare, finance, retail, telecommunications, logistics, kind of everything, actually, because uh, most fields are becoming more and more data driven. Um, if we go to the next slide, there's actually a really interesting forecast breakdown from BCG. It's called the long term forecast for quantum computing still looks bright. Um, if you want to go check that out, it was really interesting read because they kind of broke down some of these different um, some of these different types of tasks and industries that might. Why is have. it going to take so long? What do you mean? Why is it going to take so long? Why are we 10 years away? We're more than that. <laughs> if you've ever go look up a picture of a quantum computer, they look wild. It is a feat of engineering to be able to build them. They are actually crazy. But yeah, um, BCG, either way, has a really interesting report about this where they actually talk about the types of problems and the types of industries that might get impacted. And they put like actual like profit amounts, like how much they can expect to profit over certain amounts of time based on their analysis. It was a really interesting report. But they said that the kind of era of broad quantum advantage would probably begin around 2030 to 2040, which is pretty consistent from what I've heard from other experts in the field. Um, that being said, we do have quantum computing now but they don't necessarily provide the level of astronomical speed up and broad accessibility that we would kind of expect them to in several decades. So, and that being said, like I said, it doesn't necessarily impact every problem. It doesn't replace classical computers. Because if you think about like a calculator, like a calculator that you used in high school, you don't need like AI for that. You don't need a, no. right? So there's certain types of computing tasks that are just like overkill to use a quantum computer for, and also like not really worth it because they don't offer the kind of speed up um, for every type of problem. But either way, it was a really interesting report. If you guys want to go check that out, um, if we go to the next slide, here are some of the, like, the major players in the quantum computing space. Um, we got Google is a big one. Uh, they claimed quantum supremacy in 2019. Um, they released Willow in 2024. Um, this was an excerpt from that um, sort of post. They performed a standard benchmark computation in under five minutes that would take uh, today's fastest supercomputers 10 to the 25 years to solve 
which is a number that vastly exceeds the age of the universe. Although I will say that it is a benchmark calculation um, and private companies also don't have the same level of transparency that like a research institution would have, like a university would have. So I would just take some of these reports with like a grain of salt, but Google is still a major name in the quantum computing space. IBM is another big one. They started offering quantum computing cloud services in 2019. Uh, they announced their Condor, of, like it's a 1,121 qubit processor, 23. Uh, 23. Uh, Honeywell is another big name. Microsoft is another big name. IonQ, kind of more pure quantum exposure compared to some of these other ones, but still a very big name sort of in the space. I mean, we trade all these stocks, I guess, except not Honeywell. I don't think it's public anymore. I think. Is it, is it not public? I thought they got bought out by private equity or something. I, is Honeywell private? I, I H O one is the ticker. I oh, think then it is. Then it is. So, so yeah, I we don't. I don't share anymore. But um, in terms of getting some exposure to this, again, we're several decades out. You know what's so funny too? These companies but, are so old. I know. Like, yeah. But I guess like when I think about like which companies would be the best posed to like you know benefit. So like okay. So there's a couple names like Rigetti, um, IonQ, I kind of put it in that category. Um, Qubit is the ticker for another name. Like some names that have like kind of pure quantum exposure that are smaller, less established companies um, seem like kind of, I, I don't know, volatile trades, I guess, to do right now, but potential upside, right? Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of getting more established quantum computing exposure, like Google, IBM, Honeywell, Microsoft, there's some very established names um, that are in a pretty good position to potentially thrive from the emergence of this industry um, that are also a little bit more diversified, right? Um, but in terms of just, yeah, industry awareness, these are the names that I would put as sort of the most prominent. Hey, this is fun stuff, right? Um, so the big difference between primary, like the primary difference between classical computers and quantum computers is really how they represent information. This is a little aside, it's not as relevant for trading so much, but if you're wondering where the quantum really comes from in quantum computers, it really comes from how they represent information. So bits, right, are units that store information about binary systems, right? So there's two possible states. There's off and on, true or false, yes or no, binary systems. There's two possible states and bits represent information for those systems. And in modern computing, right, um, bits are physically either the presence or the absence of current or voltage. Because if you think about like, right, a computer asking a computer what two plus two is, a computer doesn't know what two is, but they understand, right, the absence of current or the presence of current. So when we talk about bits, it's really what a bit is in, cl in like classical computing. Mathematically, that's ones and zeros, right? It's usually how we represent them. So like the number 20, for example, in binary is one, zero, one, zero, I'm sorry, one, zero, one, zero, zero, right? Only that's what a classical bit is for a computer. Make sense? Okay. Well, it makes sense, but I didn't know that. Okay. See, now we're learning a new thing. Now let's go to the next slide. But a quantum bit is a little bit different. The type of information or the representation of information for a quantum machine. So qubits are based on two state quantum systems. Again, I never thought I'd be talking about this on the show, the block sphere. I had to look at this during grad school, like every freaking day. It's actually really cool. Um, but quantum particles, right, have different, very different physical properties. Um, and they have this property called superposition, as well as like a couple other properties that quantum computers really leverage that classical computers can't. But this concept of superposition, imagine like our one and zero, we have like a, we have a quantum state that can exist as kind of a mixture, some kind of probabilistic combination of one and zero at the same time. Whereas with a bit, it's either a one or a zero. With a quantum state, we have this thing that can kind of be like a probabilistic combination of one and zero at the same time, which is kind of cool. That's a property called superposition. There's like kind of four major properties that quantum computers really leverage to be able to speed up calculations and execute algorithms that classical computers can't. But superposition is kind of the most I think the most interesting one, and it's also like fundamentally very different from how classical stuff just kind of works. Like you don't see superposition, like the quantum superposition in its classical world. Yeah. Um, but this is kind of where all these sort of goofy analogies kind of come from. If you've ever heard people try to explain what a qubit well, is. Why did you want to do this? That's I wonder the same thing every day. 